All right, so chapter eight is going to focus on the energetics associated with our cells, just an overview of metabolism. Cells in general are basically um, these pretty insane chemical factories where there's all sorts of reactions taking place. Um, cells break things down to obtain energy and to get materials that they need, and then they use energy to be able to perform daily functions. And here you see an example where they've taken energy and turned it into light. Metabolism is basically accounting for all of the chemical reactions that an organism um, needs. And this is considered to be an emergent property because the molecules in the cell are being used by the organism to be able to do purposes that are totally different than what the molecules themselves would be able to do on their own. <coughs> Excuse me. A metabolic pathway will start with your reactants um, and then end with your products. They typically require multiple steps, and those steps are catalyzed by specific enzymes that will allow those reactions to proceed as you move from starting materials to your final destination with your products. Catabolic pathways are going to be able to generate energy through the release of um, by breaking bonds so that you can make smaller molecules out of larger ones. Cellular respiration is a classic catabolic pathway that takes place in cells. While anabolic pathway are going to require energy because they are making larger molecules from simpler ones. And so this would be when any of our macromolecules are used to make um, so like taking a nucleotide and making polynucleotides out of it, or taking amino acids and building peptides, taking fatty acid chains and glycerol to make a fat, um, taking monosaccharides and using them to make disaccharides or polysaccharides. Bioenergetics examines how organisms are able to manage their energy resources because they are not... Um, that's a good word for it. Um, they are not, um, oh, I can't think of it. Cells do not have unlimited amounts of energy. They have to use the energy um, materials that they have as wisely as possible so they can conduct the processes they need to be able to function. Energy is the ability to cause change. You've heard of these different forms before with kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy, we tend to see in the form of heat, um, just random movement of your molecules or your atoms. And potential energy, we can look at through um, how it is stored, where it's located at, what types of connections are formed in our molecules. And that's going to lead to the chemical energy that is present um, in our reactants and products. And we can convert this energy from one form to another. So here you've got an example with the diver on the platform where you've got examples of both potential and kinetic energy taking place, how the diver has more potential energy on the platform because they're higher up. Then they take that potential energy and convert it to kinetic energy when they dive. When they land in the water, they have less potential energy than the one on the platform does. And as they move back up um, to prepare to dive again, they are taking some of their kinetic energy and converting it into potential energy as they get higher up and being at that higher level is going to help to increase their potential energy amounts. Thermodynamics is looking at the transfer of energy. We can have isolated systems and we can have open systems. Open systems are what we have in organisms. Isolated systems are going to be more controlled. So in an open system, you can have both energy and matter transfer between the system itself as well as its surroundings. First law of thermodynamics is that you can't create energy, you can't destroy energy, but you can convert it from one form to another, similar to conservation of mass. And the second law of thermodynamics is that when you have these energy transformations occur, energy transfers occur, some energy gets lost in the form of heat. It doesn't disappear. It just goes elsewhere. And that energy is used to increase the entropy of the universe, which is the actual second law. 
that basically all energy changes are going to result in an increase in chaos, an increase in disorder in the universe itself. Cells um, are going to have some forms of their energy be converted to heat. Um, when they have processes occur that don't require any energy input, they are considered to be spontaneous. Some are slower, some um, are going to happen more rapidly. Diffusion would be an example of a spontaneous process. Um, so if it's going to happen without requiring energy, it's going to result in the entropy of the universe increasing. Biological order and disorder. Cells take lots of small materials that aren't necessarily super structured and they're able to make ordered structures from them. They can also take matter and energy that is ordered and turn it into less order forms, such as with your anabolic pathways when you, sorry, not your anabolic, your catabolic when you break things down. So in terms of an ecosystem, we can have energy enter through light and exit through heat. So because we have more complex organisms, doesn't mean that we're breaking that second law of thermodynamics. You can have increases or decreases in entropy within an organism, but as long as the universe's overall entropy is increasing, that second law is still being met. So to determine if a re um, an reaction occurs um, without an energy input, um, we can use the free energy change to determine the spontaneity of our reaction. And that is usually examined using delta G. Um, if you have a negative delta G, it's because you are giving off energy, and that energy then can be used to perform processes to do work. And so you can have negative delta G, um, which would be spontaneous, and you can have positive delta G where you require energy for those reactions to occur, and those would be non-spontaneous reactions. Okay? So how does this apply to the metabolic pathways that we have in our cells. If you have an exergonic reaction, you might remember exothermic and endothermic from chemistry. Uh, if you have an exergonic reaction, you have less free energy in your products than you had in your reactants, and that's because some of the energy was released. That would happen with your spontaneous reactions. In an endergonic reaction, the reactants have to take in energy from their surroundings because the products have more free energy than the reactants did to begin with, and those would be your non-spontaneous reactions. If you have a closed system, you will eventually reach equilibrium where the rate of the reactions moving from reactant to products and the rates going backwards from products to reactants will be equal. Cells aren't going to be that because we always have materials coming in and leaving our cells. And so met metabolism is never at this state of equilibrium because you have both your catabolic pathways that give you free energy and you have your anabolic pathways that consume that free energy so that your cells get the materials that they need to the places they need to be at. How are we able to have both exergonic and endergonic reactions occurring in our cells at the same time? Um, we have an, a, a source of, we have different ways that cells can do work. We have chemical work, we have transport work, and we have mechanical work. Um, so chemical work would be the actual reactions taking place. Transport would be the movement of things throughout the cell. And mechanical is just having the cell be able to manipulate as it needs to, um, organelles like your cilia, um, having cells themselves be able to contract and expand, being able to move the chromosomes during um, cell replication. So to have these processes occur where you have both exergonic and endergonic occur, we use um, energy molecules like ATP um, to be consumed in our endergonic reactions and then reformed as a result of our exergonic reactions. And how those are able to work hand in hand is that typically um, one of the enzymes that you're working with will get phosphorylated. It will have a phosphate group transferred from ATP and when it has that happen it's going to help um, 
to cause certain reactions to take place. And then those phosphate groups will get released again, and they can join on with the remnants of ATP, um, ADP, to make ATP again. So ATP can help with, um, will be, is made by exergonic reactions, and then is consumed again by our endergonic ones. So it looks like one of your nucleotides. Um, it's got your phosphate groups. It's got your sugar. It's got your nitrogenous base. Um, when you are wanting to hydrolyze ATP, you do that by taking off the outside phosphate group. You release energy from that terminal phosphate bond. And when that bond is broken, it causes the ADP molecule to have less free energy available um than what it would have had if it had the atp on it and that's why it's able to let go of so much energy okay so there's a more pictorial view of what i was talking about with the hydrolysis process so losing a phosphate the phosphate itself is not the source of energy but the molecule that's formed when it goes from atp to adp adp has less free energy than atp and so that energy has to be released. How do we use ATP? Um, and it said that earlier about how it can form these intermediates that aren't super stable. By phosphorylating a transport protein, you can change its shape, and that will allow things to be able to move across the membrane that would not be able to move otherwise because they're going against their concentration gradients. And when that phosphate group is removed, the protein would go back to the shape it was previously. We talked about how um, we can use our microtubules to be able to help things move. Here you have a vesicle moving along um, a cytoskeletal tract, and so ATP is able to power the movement of that motor protein so that it is able to move the vesicle from one part of the cell to another. Again, we make ATP again when we have our cells undergo an endergonic, sorry, when our, we have our cells undergo an exergonic change. Um, the ADP will join up with the free phosphate groups as a result from the process and reform the ATP again. So you will often have reactions that are paired up or pathways that are paired up in your cells, ones that require ATP and ones that consume ATP. Or, and ones that form ATP, um, so they can work hand in hand with each other. Enzymes are able to help to speed up our reactions because they reduce the activation energy requirement that is needed for the reactants to be able to form their intermediates and eventually to become products. Um, catalysts are a general name for your enzymes. They are just any sort of chemical agent that would help to speed up that process, um, but is not itself consumed in the reaction. Um, we typically refer to enzymes as catalytic proteins. We'll learn a little bit later on that actually some nucleic acids can also have enzymatic properties as well. And here you see a reaction between sucrose and how the enzyme sucrase is helping to break that bond to hydrolyze sucrose to perform its monomers, glucose, and fructose. So in order for reactants to be able to transition and form products, bonds have to be broken, and then to form the new products, bonds have to be made. Um, the energy that is needed to get the reactants in that transition state where they're able to form the products is called your activation energy. Um, and enzymes basically reduce that activation energy amount. They don't change the net free energy change that's associated with the reactions. All they do is provide a shortcut to help the reactants transition to products more rapidly. And you can kind of see here in this picture, there's your reactants. You're trying to find a way to get to that transition state a little bit more quickly than you would if you just went about the traditional pathway or the pathway the reactants would normally go through. The reactants need to run into each other. They need to collide. And enzymes can help to make it so that those collisions are more effective. It can also impact on the reactants to help make it easier to break those connections so they can form the products. So there you see the, in black 
what the activation energy requirement would be for this reaction without an enzyme, and then in red, what it would be if you happen to have an enzyme. So substrates are your reactants, and that is this um, the part of your, or that is the reactant that the enzyme is specifically acting on in that reaction. Um, you can see the active site where the substrate is able to bind. This is that lock and key mechanism. Um, when you have the enzyme and substrate together, you have the enzyme substrate complex. There is a specific site again on the enzyme where the substrate is able to bind. That is its active site. And the two basically fit in like hand and glove um, so that they will fit um, super closely together. Um, you'll notice it says an induced fit will make chemical groups of the active site. Um, basically, if the substrate is going to respond better to being closer to polar amino acids or to basic amino acids, it can basically adjust it so that those chemical groups are more closer or in positions where they're going to best benefit the substrate and make the substrate be able to transition to a product more efficiently. So here you see the substrates joining on to the enzyme. They enter the active site, and then the enzyme basically folds in around those substrates. And there are different ways that the enzyme can act on the substrates to reduce that activation energy barrier. They can help to allow the substrates to be oriented properly so that their collisions are more effective. They can cause strains in the bonds for the individual substrates, um, so that'll make it easier for those to be broken. They might create an environment, again, acidic, basic, polar, nonpolar, that would be more effective um, for those substrates to be able to interact with one another. Um, so the substrates, again, are not held in necessarily by covalent bonds. They're held in by intermolecular forces, but they can form transitional, um, very temporary covalent bonds with the enzyme. It will do that if that will benefit the substrate in terms of breaking the bonds that need to be um, separated so that they can transition to form that intermediate and then eventually their products. Once they're converted, the substrates are now released as products and the active site is available again for additional substrate mo uh, molecules. So factors that can influence an enzyme's ability to work. The amount of substrate you have present initially, the more of it you have, the more molecules can interact with the enzyme and help to speed up that reaction. Temperature and pH, since that can affect the active site and how well the enzyme is able to interact with the substrate. And then there are chemicals that can impact on the enzyme, both, beneficial, um, both with benefits and with detriments. Um, every enzyme um, is going to work most effectively at a certain temperature and pH. If you end up outside of that temperature to pH range, that can distort the enzyme shape and no longer allow it to work effectively. And that would be when your enzyme has become denatured. Here you see a couple of examples of enzymes and it really just depends on where that enzyme is working as to what the optimal temperature and what the optimal pH would be. What is its environment? Where does it need to work? Um, and what conditions are most favorable for it to work in that environment. So I talked about how you can have chemicals that indirectly impact on your enzymes. Um, cofactors are non-protein enzyme helpers, and they basically, in this particular example, are making it easier for the substrate to be able to join on and interact with the enzyme. You can have inorganic cofactors or you can have organic cofactors. Inorganics would be like metal ions. Or organic cofactors um, are going to be coenzymes, and vitamins would fall in this category. Again, I said that some of the chemicals are going to be beneficial and others not so much. Um, here we have two examples of inhibitors, things that are going to impact and not allow the enzyme to work effectively. One of these is called a competitive inhibitor, and that is a substance that binds to the active site of your enzyme, so the substrate is no longer able 
to bind there effectively. And then you can have non-competitive inhibitors. They don't bind directly to the subactive site of that enzyme, but they bind to a portion of the enzyme and change the shape of that active site. And that doesn't necessarily allow the substrate to be able to bind anymore. And there are some examples of inhibitors and toxins, poisons, pesticides, antibiotics um, that will prevent enzymes um, from working correctly and therefore shut down metabolic pathways. Um, so being able to regulate enzyme activity is going to play a big role in the cell utilizing the resources it has as effectively as possible. If you have every possible chemical reaction occurring in a cell at a given time, you're going to have chaos erupt. Cells don't need everything to happen all of the time. They may have all of the information to conduct those different pathways, but that would be like you trying to study for AP Bio and AP English and AP Government all simultaneously. It does not work super well. You have to have some sort of plan in place. And so how the cell is able to maintain uh, or regulate these pathways is by having chemicals that will impact on whether or not the genes that either make the specific enzymes or make factors that regulate the enzymes activity, whether those particular genes are actually working, if they're turned on, or whether they're shut down. So one way that that can happen is with allosteric regulation. And so what allosteric regulation can do, it can both inhibit and it can both stimulate an enzyme's activity. And that's when you have one of these regulatory molecules and it binds to a protein at one particular site and that's going to impact on that protein's function in another site. And so this we're gonna look at here with hemoglobin. You've got four different, um, this is an allosteric enzyme with four subunits, and you've got four active sites, and you've got four regulatory sites. And when you have a chemical come in that is going to stimulate um, that particular enzyme, it's going to bind between one of the four subunits. So it's not going to bind to one of the active sites. It's not going to bind um, to to change the shape of the enzyme in either a positive direction or negative direction, but it's going to stabilize that shape by having that activator in one of the regulatory sites. It keeps that enzyme's active site in the shape that will best benefit it so that the substrate can come in and interact with it effectively. If you have another chemical come in that is going to bind to one of those regulatory sites, it can change the shape of the enzyme such that the active site is no longer available. And that would be when you have an inhibitor bind and that's going to shut down that enzyme. Okay, so allosteric enzymes can have both activators and inhibitors depending on what the cell's needs are at the time. I thought hemoglobin was one we were getting ready to do. I'm sorry, hemoglobin's on this one. Cooperativity is when you have a substrate molecule kind of bind on to one of your active sites and it enhances the other active sites that are present on that enzyme if there happen to be multiple sites um, to bind additional substrate molecules. So hemoglobin does this by taking on one oxygen molecule at one of the four um, active sites that are present. And when it does that, it changes the shape of the other components making up the hemoglobin molecule so that they are more willing to accept additional oxygen molecules until the hemoglobin molecule is fully saturated with oxygen. And then finally, we're going to talk about feedback inhibition. So Sometimes cells will use the product of a metabolic pathway to shut down that particular metabolic pathway. Um, when the cell gets to certain amounts of whatever the desired product is, it may no longer need to make additional product. And so here we have threonine being turned into isoleucine. Well, isoleucine is able to bind allosterically to the enzyme 
that takes that three and nine and starts to turn it into the intermediates. It does that way back at the initial first step. So when sufficient amounts of isoleucine are present, it will bind allosterically to that enzyme, changing the active site shape and no longer allowing 309 to be able to be transitioned into the intermediates. And when the cell uses up the isoleucine that is present and it needs to make more isoleucine, that isoleucine that's bound to the allosteric site will come off and the active site will become available again. And then 309 can be broken down again into isoleucine.